Imagine waking up three in the morning. Mind you, I'm living with my grandpa, so imagine my face when I see he can't talk. Matter of fact, the only thing he got out was I can't breathe. All I'm thinking to myself is you can't leave. Now imagine a family of a garner. Matter of fact, any father who was lost there in the heat of the moment, I bet that moment feel real slow. And they say that we're free. Here in America, the beautiful. Yeah, yeah, truth be told, let even all in slow motion. I was able to save him, yep, kept my grandpa from choking. Still hoping he gonna get better. We gonna do it again. We overcoming them odds. Yeah, we so destined to win. Yep, yep. Four days in the hospital, came home. Thankful that my fam came over. I was standing right there when he did pass on. It's all good, though. We remain strong. Matter of fact, still feel him that we ain't gone. One thing that he did pass on is the heart of a brave man, a real bad man. In America, unusual, this real black man would have even survived in the 1930s. Growing up in South Carolina, think about it. And the same bloodline that was running inside him, now inside me. Running through me, I've been beat down, been locked up, it ain't moved me. And my pops got it too, he a true G, they show me. Now when the mission, the same as the motivation, that passion propel you forward. See it all in my face that I go to war for these kids. Hustling, training them daily, so NASA once in a while. Snuffing Bonham and Bailey, go to Pluto and back just to save the life of a child. Some people love it or hate it, look, either way I just smile, cause... You don't know what I've been through. Thank you. So I dedicate that piece to the late, great Wade Brown. That was my grandfather. He's actually a chemist. And I teach science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. So what I want to talk to you today about is this problem that we have that affects everyone in this room. Right? Here you see math literacy scores around the globe, and what do you see? What jumps out? The U.S. is behind in math and science, actually below the international average. Now, our challenge as educators is how do we teach the students we have now and prepare them for a future that we don't even know what the jobs are going to look like? So if we zoom in on America and we look at graduation rates, we're striking Washington, D.C. has the lowest graduation rate in the country, right here in the nation's capital. And it has been that way for consecutive years, and that's a problem, because our education system is failing our kids, right? It's outdated. We're using an 18th century education system for a time that we've never known. We have information, infinite knowledge and technology at the palm of our hands. So it's time for us to upgrade our education system. So what you see here is uh, dropout rates, right? So as you can see, they're actually going down. Most people argue a lot dropout rate is declining, but what isn't declining is that big bar at the bottom that represents low-income families. Low-income families still represent the biggest percentage of our dropouts, right? So enough, enough about the problems. Let's talk about some solutions. How can we actually fix this problem? How can we fix our education system? Because we know it's linked to so many other things, right? So, we have studies that show any child that receives some type of musical education or some type of musical training automatically develops better brain chemistry at a young age than kids who don't. The facts are there. So you know how powerful music is in learning. Let's see. A, B, C, D, E, F. You've heard this before. We don't teach it. A, B, C, D. That's not how we teach, right? So why are we taking the arts out of our schools? That doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. So we know anytime you're playing music, you're, you're using your audio, your visual, and your motory skills all at once. So your brain is firing left and right. And that strength that you build up is shown in other areas, right? So you see it in academics. I had the benefit of being able to take music lessons when I was younger. I took piano when I was seven. And that led me to find my passion, which was music, right? And that carried me throughout my elementary and secondary education because I knew, one, I had to finish my homework and I had to get good grades because that was the only way I was going to get to play music and do shows on the weekends. So propelling me all the way to high school, my senior year, I'm like, all right, I'm ready. I'm going to graduate. I'm going to be a rock star. And my parents are looking at me like, boy, you know you're going to college, right? <laughs> so I said, okay. I learned two things when I went to college. One, I learned how to solve problems like an engineer. I learned how to think. 
Two, I learned that I fell in the vast majority of people who go to college and basically study something that they don't have a passion for. And we end up not using what we actually went to school and paid all that money for. We spent so much time and money doing it. So what I did, I founded the Swaliga Foundation, which the sole purpose of the Swaliga Foundation is to help people find their passion, find what it is they like to do, right? So when I came back to Washington, D.C., I graduated with a degree in architectural engineering, and I knew I had a passion for music, so I wanted to give back to the community. I went to the Boys and Girls Clubs at Greater Washington. So I walk in, I'm all excited, I'm bright-eyed, I got my Swaliga shirt on, like, hey, I want to do art with kids, let's do it, let's rock. And then they're like, well, first of all, we're happy to see you, because most people don't just walk in off the street and volunteer. <laughs> Second, <laughs> they showed me around and they told me about this STEAM initiative that they had, and they told me that we got this music equipment donated, we have a studio, nobody here to run it. So my eyes automatically lit up because I saw the potential that was there, right? So I began volunteering at the Boys and Girls Clubs and for about four months, and I loved it. We were do doing great work. And then um, my parents were looking at me like, yeah, that's cool, we love what you're doing, but boy, you know you need a job, right? <laughs> so I said, I know, you're right. So I'm applying, I'm uh, going to job interviews. The same week, the very same week that I get offered an engineering position, a grant came through to the Boys and Girls Clubs that would allow me to teach there full time. So I had to take my own advice, and I followed my passion. The choice for me, for me was easy, right? It wasn't about the money. I wanted to build on the work that we were doing. So our challenge is how do we get kids that are stuck in this box? They're in public school for six hours a day. They come to us after school. What do you think their reaction is if you just throw a book in front of them like, hey, today we're going to learn calculus? Not going to get a great response, probably. So our challenge is tapping into things that they're interested in. So we started doing things like the science of sound, right? How do we as humans actually hear sound? The smallest bone in the human body is in our inner ear, right? How do sound waves move through the air? And then we're making music, we're making beats, and they go home all excited. They're telling their parents, they're telling their friends, like, yeah, we were in the studio with Mr. Lamont. He was rapping, we were doing music. And that's all very true, but we were also doing physics. We're doing mathematics, we're doing calculus, and we're doing the things that they need to learn in school, but they just don't really receive it in that way. And that's where you get STEAM, right? STEAM is the, the intersection of all of these different things. And that program developed into what became known as STEAM the Block. And we did this in War 7, one of the most impoverished communities in Washington, D.C., which, as we saw, is, has some of the lowest performing schools in the country and in the world. So we saw success with this particular program because we did one thing. We asked them, what do you want to learn? How do you want to learn? And we gave them the tools. So we put our teens in the studio, in a creative space, with other STEAM professionals, so your young engineers, your young doctors. And then we even brought in young artists as well, performing artists, visual artists. And all of these people are in one room working on science and engineering activities. And what does that do? That creates this culture, right? That creates an environment that reminds them that education is supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be fun to learn, right? But our public school system doesn't teach us that. It actually stifles our creativity. So the kids, they automatically go and they bring more kids. So we saw the program grow tremendously and we saw amazing stories of success. So our challenge was how do we get this opportunity out to more students so that they can feel this, this experience? And I came up with the True Cool Tour. Basically what that is, I gathered my coolest friends from around the galaxy, and <laughs> we put on this concert. And the first of its kind to ever basically incorporate STEAM educational activities during the show. So you'll be listening to like a band, and then next, next thing you know, we're doing engineering activities, right? And this really just to create that culture and to remind our students that learning is supposed to be fun. Right? So after we did a show at McKinley Tech, which is a high school in D.C., we did this same tour in the Boys and Girls Clubs in D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. This particular show we did in Ward 8, which is another impoverished community right here in D.C. I'll never forget, I'm on the mic, and we're doing the show, 
I'm doing my thing, and there's this kid in the front row. He's glued to the drums. He's not even paying me any attention. He's glued to the drums, just watching them. After the show, we normally give the kids the chance to, you know, play with the instruments and the technology, meet the artists. He automatically runs up to the drums. He's like, can I play, can I play? I'm like, yeah, go ahead. He starts rocking the drums like he's across the street at the Verizon Center, just <laughs> at a concert. I'm like, okay, okay. His mom walks in, and she stops, and she's just staring at him. She's like, Oh my gosh, she's like, he doesn't play drums. I'm like, are you kidding? Do you, are you listening to him right now? <laughs> Natural ability was there. So she goes, I, what I mean is he's never taken any lessons. We don't even have a drum set at home. I was like, wow. Then she goes, last week he was actually diagnosed with ADHD and they prescribed him medication. I said, ma'am, listen, I'm not a doctor, but what I do know for sure is that before you give him any medication, Please enroll him in drum lessons or some type of musical training because all he really needs is that creative outlet, right? And just to be able to help a family discover that was very rewarding to me. So I wanted to see how we can get this opportunity out to even more young people, right? So they can experience it. Steam the Block is starting up again this school year. Our goal now is to take 12 of our young leaders to South Africa. Why? Why would we do that? Because if we're, our job is to train our young leaders, we know that they're going to have to cross these cultural boundaries in the future. To solve these global problems, we're going to have to work together. And one thing that's interesting, South Africa, Cape Town specifically, those stats that we saw earlier, mirror images to Washington, D.C. Education is linked to what? Graduation, crime, unemployment, right? Our economic system, education is rooted in all of these things. So, the interesting thing that we do is we use passion to fuel our education, right? We tap into a kid's passion. And really, if we're spending millions of dollars to figure out best practices or what the new standards should be, or we should teach this one, really, I challenge all of you, my educators, my parents, my community leaders, let's start by one thing. The first thing we have to do, let's ask our young scholars, how do you want to learn? Thank you.